Israel Finkelstein is a leading figure in the archaeology and history of ancient Israel. Over 40 years of fieldwork and research, he has helped to change the way archaeology is conducted, the Bible is interpreted, and the history of Israel is reconstructed. I sat down with Israel over several sessions to talk about how a lifetime of work has informed the story of ancient Israel. Israel, welcome back. Today's a big day. Happy to be here. Today we're going to be talking about the city of Jerusalem from the Late Bronze Age through the Iron Age. Of course, this is a very hotly debated topic at certain points in the chronology, uh, specifically in the period of the United Monarchy. Uh, we've talked about the United Monarchy and David and Solomon in particular in some detail in earlier discussions. The construction of the temple is also wound up in this. And yet archaeology does not seem to fit very well uh, not only the stories of David and Solomon, but to the descriptions of Jerusalem during their time period. So today I want to zoom out and look at Jerusalem as a place archaeologically from, let's go back to the Late Bronze Age and move on through the period of the Israelite monarchies. So give us an introduction. I think that uh, before we start really going into the history of Jerusalem, into the archaeology of Jerusalem, starting in the Late Bronze Age and going down to the later phases of the Iron Age, we need to speak about several uh, issues as a background. First of all, the topography, because we will be repeating names here in the topography. When we speak about uh, biblical times, Jerusalem, we refer to three uh, specific areas and another point. The specific areas are the Temple Mount, then south of the Temple Mount, uh, there is this ridge which continues from Al-Aqsa Mosque to the south and is titled by modern scholars the City of David. And then there is the part which is to the west where the uh, Armenian and Jewish quarters of Jerusalem are now located and it is referred to usually as the western hill or the southwestern uh, hill of Jerusalem. It is part uh, of the story when especially when we come to the Iron Age. And then of course near the, on the eastern slope uh, of the city of David Ridge, to the south of the Temple Mount, there is another point which is extremely important to mention, and I refer here to the spring, because there's no life without the spring in Jerusalem. The spring of Gihon is there. The second uh, background uh, theme that uh, I think we should uh, uh, discuss is the titles given by scholars to places in uh, ancient, in old Jerusalem. And I refer here to titles such as the City of David, quote-unquote, or uh, the Milo, for instance, quote-unquote. These uh, names come, uh, geographical names, come from the biblical text, of course. However, we should remember and we should uh, be extremely careful in using them because we don't really know what they mean. We don't really know what the Bible means when the Bible speaks about the city of David. There's no place that we can really pinpoint on the ridge to the south of the Temple Mount. Perhaps it is in the Temple Mount. There's no way to clarify this question. And the third issue that needs to be discussed before we dive into the history, archaeology and history of Jerusalem, is the most important one, the location of the original mount. Because we know that in the ancient Near East, when it comes to the Bronze and Iron Ages, there are these mounds, tells, like the mound of Megiddo, or the mound of Hazor, or the mound of Ashkelon in the southern coastal plain. And we know also that the phenomenon of mounds exists also in the highlands at Chechem, Bethel, Hebron. So the question is, where is the original mound of Jerusalem? Most scholars would say that the Bronze and Iron Age tell is simply where the city of David is today. Of course, uh, this is the traditional uh, way of looking at, uh, into the archaeology of Jerusalem. I think that there are major difficulties that uh, make it impossible to identify the city of David Ridge as the original mound of Jerusalem. First of all, it doesn't look like a mound. We know the silhouette of a mound in the ancient Near East, in the Levant, uh, in the lowlands and in the highlands. The city of David Ridge does not have a silhouette of a mound. Secondly, 
not all the city of David Ridge is inhabited in all periods with remains. Uh, for instance, the southern part, uh, there is bedrock other under the late Iron Age uh, uh, remains. So where is the Bronze Age at all? I mean, how to resolve this problem? Thirdly, in the highlands, usually the mounds are located on top of a hill because this gives them um, uh, an advantage from the point of view of uh, protecting themselves, security, defense. Uh, and then uh, another problem is that the city of David Ridge is completely dominated on three sides by uh, higher grounds. So, of course, we are not speaking about a period of mortars and guns that you can shoot you know, from far away, but still, not a good idea to be dominated in such a way on all uh, sides. These are some of the difficulties, but there is one difficulty which is more important than the others, and that is that there are periods in the history of Jerusalem well documented, well documented, with no evidence in the city of David, on the city of David Ridge. Let me give you an example, the Late Bronze Age, where, for which we have good documentation in the Amarna period. During the Amarna period in the 14th century BC, Jerusalem was a major city-state uh, which uh, ruled over the southern part of the highlands and was also one of the most important, um, you know, on the general background of the country. Uh, however, on the city of David Ridge, there are no remains, almost no remains from the late Bronze Age. Here and there, a piece of pottery. That's about it. So where is the city of Abdi Khipa, the ruler of uh, Jerusalem during the Amarna period? So from Almost every perspective that we look at, the city of David is not, in my opinion, a good candidate for the Mount of Jerusalem. If we don't find late Bronze Age remains anywhere in Jerusalem, what, what can we do? <laughs> uh, we need to uh, uh, go back to an idea proposed 20 years ago by a German scholar, a colleague of ours, Axel Knauf, who proposed that the original mound of Jerusalem should be sought on the Temple Mount. In fact, he was not the first one to suggest it, and now we are not the first one to suggest it. The Temple Mount is an ideal location because it is located on top of a hill. It is very well protected. It is not dominated by grounds on all uh, sides. Uh, and it has enough space uh, in it for a relatively large mound. Let's take the Herodian compound of the Temple Mount. It measures about 450 meters long and 250 meters wide from east to west. There is enough space there to plant, so to speak, a mound of, uh, let's say, about five hectares. The biggest mound in the highlands, such as the Mount of Shechem, is about five, three, four, five hectares. So an equivalent size mound can be planted uh, in the center of the Temple Mount. This is a possibility. Uh, and this resolves many of the questions. Of course, uh, the problem is that we cannot verify this uh, proposal because it is not uh, possible to excavate in the Temple Mount for the very clear sensitivities, uh, religious uh, and political. Uh, how Still, we know from uh, projects that uh, had been conducted around the Temple Mount, Temple Mount was inhabited in the Bronze and Iron Ages. I refer to simply uh, uh, pottery uh, shirts, which uh, were eroded from the top of the Temple Mount, even in antiquity, to the slopes, and in excavations conducted today, we find them. Uh, another reason for not being able to find anything on the Temple Mount, even without the political sensitivities and religious uh, ones, is the very fact that uh, King Herod the Great uh, built this immense uh, compound for the second temple uh, there. And this was one of the biggest projects ever to have been conducted in the land of Israel, architecturally speaking. So for this uh, project, he had to level uh, the top of the mound and also uh, create, um, uh, add the fields in order to flatten the top of the mound. So I doubt very much uh, about uh, the remains that uh, survived, you know, this big operation uh, in the first century BC. You have a few problems with the theory. 
uh, distance to water and uh, the fact that to this day you can go and see bedrock right at the summit. Absolutely. Uh, I think that both of them are not such a big problem if we compare Jerusalem to other mounds in the highlands. Uh, the first thing is the water. Indeed, the spring of Gihon is right at the bottom of the city of David Ridge. However, it is about 300, 250 meters away from the Temple Mount. So there is distance there. Yet, uh, this is the situation in many of the mounds of the highlands. The moment they, they decided to construct their sites, their settlement on top of a hill, made them already far from the water because the water is usually on the slope. So take uh, Samaria, for instance, the capital of the Northern Kingdom of Israel. The water there is even farther away than the situation in Jerusalem. Take Kiryat Yarim, where uh, the two of us uh, excavated uh, a while ago. The water is also there, about 250, 300 meters from the mound on top of the hill. The other issue, the fact that uh, there is bedrock uh, on top uh, under the Dome of the Rock is also not surprising when we compare to other mounds in the highlands. In most of these highlands, there was big erosion in antiquity and bedrock is exposed uh, on top, on the summit. Uh, I can give several uh, examples. One of them is Tel Nazbe, the location of Mitzpah, a little bit to the north of uh, Jerusalem. Over there, you, one can see bedrock really uh, um, exposed uh, at the summit, even in, in the mound of Kiryat Yarim. Uh, bedrock uh, is about half a meter away from uh, the flat top of the mound today. So this is the situation and we should not be surprised. I, I don't think that these are dif real difficulties to the proposal to locate the original mound on the Temple Mount. And still, there is something that we can say about Jerusalem before the Iron Age, right? Yeah, sure, we need to start before the Iron Age because in order to understand the Iron Age, we need to look back at the situation in the Bronze Age. So. We know from past explorations that Jerusalem was inhabited in the Bronze Age, in the Early Bronze, in the Middle Bronze. There are significant monuments from the, uh, near the water, from the, near the spring, from the Middle Bronze Age. And of course, in the Late Bronze, we know from the Amarna tablets. So the evidence is there. I suppose that we can say that the mound was on the Temple Mount. There is a certain difficulty with this uh, proposition regarding the Middle Bronze because of the monumental architecture that um, has uh, been uh, recently discovered in recent years uh, near the spring dating to the Middle Bronze Age. But the answer should be that probably the center of the town, the main tail, was on the Temple Mount and they protected the spring by some sort of a fortress, fortifications, and this is what we identify, what we see today near the spring from the Middle Bronze Age. For the late bones, uh, as I mentioned before, there is very little in the city of David Ridge, only a shared here and a shared there. I suppose that we don't have at all evidence or almost none for architecture, houses, any construction activity. So the uh, mound must have been located on the Temple Mount. This was Jerusalem of the Amarna period, uh, the Jerusalem that ruled over the entire southern part uh, of the highlands. Uh, by the way, this is a situation that start in, starts in the Bronze Age and continues into the Iron Age. Here we have the typical classic long durée, the division of the highlands, the central highlands of Canaan, into two uh, territorial units, one dominated by Shechem in the northern part, at Samaria, and one dominated by Jerusalem in the south. This is, situation continues, in fact, into the Iron Age because Israel and Judah are exactly the continuation of the same situation of uh, division of the highlands into two, north and south. And uh, Jerusalem, although located on the southern fringe of the highlands in a geographical position, which is a little bit dumb, problematic by, from the perspective of climate and also uh, geology, rock formations, and so on is still an important place in the late Bronze Age because from the here we have the big we have the big advantage of being able to read uh, to look at the Amarna tablets and we see that the ruler of Jerusalem in the 14th century BC uh, is a dominant figure on the scene of Canaan and uh, he is in a clashing with the city states 
in the lowlands and uh, he is uh, one of those figures, uh, uh, important ones on the national scene, on the general scene of the Southern Levant of Canaan in the Bronze Age. In, and this situation continues probably also after the Amarna period. Unfortunately, we don't have the textual information for the 13th century BC, but there is no reason to think uh, otherwise. And this situation also continues, in fact, into the beginning of the Iron Age. I don't see a reason, also not an archaeological reason, for anything different in Jerusalem in the Iron Age, in the beginning of the Iron Age too. The evidence from the city of David Ridge is extremely limited. And there are biblical traditions regarding Jerusalem before David, right? First of all, the name Jebus for the city of Jerusalem, Jebus, which was conquered by King David. We don't really know the meaning of this uh, name, this toponym. We don't really know the background. Uh, who, who, what was Jebus, who were the Jebusites, who are also mentioned in the Bible as the uh, autochthonous population of Jerusalem before the conquest of King David. The conquest of King David is also not very easy to decipher because the story as we read it today is probably, in my opinion at least, an etiological story, which means uh, people in the later phases of the Iron Age, when the texts were composed, they, they were aware of the many tunnels, uh, rock cut tunnels in the vicinity of the spring, of the Gihon Spring. So they started telling a story about the conquest of Jerusalem by King David. This is the typical etiological story. From the point of view of uh, history, not really archaeology, we should uh, refer uh, to again to the time of King Saul, to the period uh, described uh, supposedly in the text of the rise of David to power in the first book of Kings. We have already discussed the question of uh, King Saul and I uh, suggested to you that we are dealing with an historical situation, maybe an historical figure uh, in the 10th century BC. We know that King Saul ruled from an area north of Jerusalem, whether Jerusalem also was in his domain or not, we don't really know. There is a clue in the fact that King Saul is active in the southern part of the highlands of Judah, south of Jerusalem and southwest of Jerusalem. So one can suggest that Jerusalem was also part of his territorial entity in the 10th century BC, but we don't really know. Let's turn to the heart of the matter here, the archeology span of 10th century Jerusalem, the United Monarchy. There were frantic uh, attempts to identify 10th century uh, monuments in Jerusalem. For those researchers who accept the description of the great united monarchy and with it the description of this wonderful city, glamorous Jerusalem of the time of David and Solomon, they must uh, come up with something in the field. I mean some sort of monumental architecture, something that uh, would uh, fit, you know, this uh, description in the Bible. And indeed there were two monuments that um, have recently been mentioned in relation to Jerusalem of the 10th century BC. The first one is the stepped stone structure. This is some sort of a support structure which was constructed on the eastern slope of the city of David Ridge above the spring. Uh, and some scholars uh, suggested that uh, it should be dated to the 10th century BC. In my opinion, we are dealing with support of the slope in uh, um, different periods because this is a very sensitive part of the city when the city starts expanding from the Temple Mount already because then the city of David Ridge over there is very narrow and collapse of the eastern slope would make it even narrower. So the people of Jerusalem, when the city started expanding, started to support the slope by this sort of revetment, stone support, and this is the uh, stepped stone structure. As far as I can judge, according to pottery retrieved in the past from between the courses of the structure, it should be dated, the pottery uh, dates this pottery to the 9th century, I suppose, BC. So the structure should be dated to the 9th century 
or to the even beginning of the 8th century BC. The second uh, building uh, which uh, has been uh, mentioned in relation to the 10th century BC uh, is more dramatic, so to speak, uh, for the point of view of uh, the public, uh, because a few years ago, uh, our colleague Elat Mazar uh, conducted, carried out excavations above the spring on top of the city of David Ridge, about 100 meters or so south of uh, the Temple Mount. And she discovered there what she described as a monumental building that she identified with the palace of King David from the 10th century BC. The building is in the remains there are very important. So it was indeed an extremely important excavation for understanding the expansion of Jerusalem. I would say even the first expansion to the south in the direction of the spring out of the Temple Mount. However, as far as I can judge again, I don't think that we are dealing there with a single building. There are several walls, uh, remains there. They do not all come from the same moment, from the same period. And I think that the earliest construction there should be put also in the 9th century BC, perhaps together with the revetment on the slope. Perhaps they were connected, the two of them. Perhaps we are dealing here with some sort of a fort uh, guarding the spring from the top of the city of uh, David Ridge. But we are not dealing with monuments from the 10th century. So there is no escape, in my opinion, from, the, from stating, from saying, from asserting that uh, the city of the time of David and Solomon was located on the Temple Mount. So we are still in a phase before the expansion of Jerusalem in the direction of the spring. And, and this is really sort of funny because uh, you see the suggestion, my suggestion, suggestion to put, uh, to identify the location of the city in the Temple Mount saves in fact uh, Jerusalem of uh, uh, David and Solomon from uh, oblivion. If Jerusalem of these earlier periods is indeed under the Temple Mount, at some point the city expands into other, outside of the Mount itself. Indeed, because it is really a big city in late monarchic times. So the question is, when is the moment when the city starts expanding? I think that the moment is in the 9th century. And here we turn to archaeology, because there is solid evidence, in my opinion, for this process. The evidence comes from three spots south of the Temple Mount. The meaning is that the expansion was in a southern direction, in the direction of the spring to include the spring, so to speak, in the, in the city. And the evidence comes from the excavation above the spring, the one which I mentioned a minute ago. Uh, another place is another excavation of the same archaeologist, Elat Mazar, a very important one, immediately to the south of Al-Aqsa Mosque, a distance of maybe 20 meters from the southern wall of the Temple Mount, where she discovered a, a, a very impressive uh, building or buildings dating, in my opinion, to the 9th century BC. And then there is another spot uh, a little bit to the south, about 100, 150 meters to the southwest. All of them, when put on a map, show the beginning of expansion of Jerusalem uh, from the Temple Mount to the south, which means the main part of the city was still, of course, in the Temple Mount. Uh, and here we have to mention another issue. Today, when we look at the Temple Mount, uh, we are influenced by what we see, which means an open esplanade uh, with a single building in the center. This is the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque in the south. And uh, we are also influenced by what we know about uh, Herodian times, because in the time of Herod the Great, there was this compound with the Temple in the center and everything was open around it, open space. However, this is not the situation in the Iron Age, in the Bronze and Iron Age. What we know about cities in the ancient Near East, in the Bronze Age, the city-states, and what we know about the hubs of the territorial kingdoms in the Iron Age, everything was on the mound, on the same mound. There were no open spaces like this. So we need to imagine the temple and the palace, or let's say the palace, which was probably the bigger building, and the dynastic temple as one compound, but 
a compound within the context of the, of the settlement, of the town. And this was the situation also in the 9th century. However, they started expanding uh, in the direction of the spring. What are the circumstances of this expansion? Oh, well, the question is exactly when in the 9th century, because here we go into the details of chronology. I suppose, although uh, this is um, an assumption which is really difficult to verify, I suppose that the moment came in the second half of the 9th century in the context of uh, Jerusalem uh, starting to play uh, an important role in the politics of the region under the hegemony of uh, first maybe the northern kingdom of Israel in the time of the Omrides in the first half of the 9th century, but more so under the domination of Damascus perhaps in the second half of the 9th century. But Jerusalem still hasn't reached its, its full potential as in late mon monarchic times. So how do we get from this first expansion to giant Jerusalem? The first exp expansion is, meaning, in, is significant, is meaningful, because we are dealing with a uh, shift from the mound on the mound, we said before, maybe five hectares, to a situation in the ninth century of about nine hectares, something like this. So it is significant. Uh, and the question, of course, uh, is how long did this situation linger? And my answer would be that this continues until, let's say, the middle of the 8th century, possibly even a little bit later. And uh, the big leap forward in the history of Jerusalem is there in the 8th century BC, because then all of a sudden in late monarchic times, Jerusalem becomes really big. It uh, expands from this 9 hectares of the 9th century to a fortified city of uh, about 60 hectares. So the population grows dramatically, six times over, something like that. And then we, uh, and, and Jerusalem is, is, is an important place now, an important city, one of the, perhaps the biggest in the entire Southern Levant. And we need to ask two questions. The first one is what uh, exactly happened and uh, when exactly did it happen? Or the other way around, when first? I should say, first of all, that we are dealing not only with uh, a, a big Jerusalem in the 8th century BC, we are dealing also with uh, a dramatic expansion in Judah in the number of settlements and in, uh, from the demographic point of view. Uh, Judah takes a big leap forward in the 8th century uh, BC, uh, in a dramatic one in all areas, in the southern part of the highlands, south of Jerusalem, in the Shefela, in the west. And this continues from the 8th century into the 7th century until the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians in 586 uh, BC. So the first question is exactly when? Difficult to say. Uh, historically, I think that we can suggest that this happens uh, in the second half of the 8th century because of two reasons. So here we combine the when and why for two reasons. I don't see a reason for six times over expansion of Jerusalem, demographic explanation for this uh, before. I don't see the big attraction of Jerusalem from the economic point of view until the second half of the 8th century. The second half of the 8th century, we have the two uh, important factors. First of all, the takeover of the Northern Kingdom of Israel by Assyria between 732 and 720 BC and the deportations of Israelites from this territory to Mesopotamia. And I think that here we have uh, refugees that come from Israel and they move to Jerusalem and they move to the countryside of Judah. And these Israelites who come, they probably come from the upper echelons of the Israelite society because these were the people who were at risk of deportation. Otherwise, why should a person leave his uh, village uh, and land and move to Jerusalem? We see this movement of people to Jerusalem in the material culture, which means I, I am not inventing something for my, only for my imagination. We see impact of Israelite material culture, which is characteristic of Israel in the 9th century and the beginning of the 8th century, appearing in Judah only in the late 8th century and the beginning of the 7th century BC. And this comes probably 
uh, from uh, these uh, Israelites who moved to Judah. And in fact, Judah, Jerusalem of the late 8th century and Judah of the late 8th century and onward uh, is not anymore a Judahite uh, territory as such, but a combination of Israelites and the Judahites making the population of the southern kingdom uh, after the Assyrian takeover of the north. And the Assyrian takeover of the north does not only impact Israel, it impacts also uh, Judah in the sense that Judah is now incorporated into the Assyrian world economy, we can say even into the Assyrian globalized economy in the sense that Judah helps the Assyrians uh, in control over the Arabian trade uh, route in the south, the lucrative uh, Arabian trade. Judah makes a buck, you know, from this uh, uh, trade of the south under Assyria. And Judah also goes through a very interesting process, in my opinion, of agricultural specialization, industrial specialization. I speak about the industry of the agricultural output, oil and wine, uh, in the late 8th century. So all this makes uh, Judah an important place and Jerusalem as the center of the kingdom and Jerusalem becomes a very uh, big uh, city uh, of about uh, 10 or 12,000 people. And this is also a very important background for understanding the power of Judah at that time and the power of the possibility of composition of biblical text because we spoke about it in a previous uh, discussion, conversation of the two of us, that uh, Jerusalem specifically and Judah in general uh, already experienced a very impressive expansion of uh, scribal activity and possibility to compose texts. So we have a new Judah. What does this mean for the development of the biblical traditions then? It means a lot on two grounds. First of all, this migration of Israelites to Judah, they bring with them, in my opinion, texts uh, of northern traditions that were composed, in my opinion, in the first half of the 8th century. We spoke about this possibility in one of our previous uh, discussions. And uh, these northern texts are brought into Judah and then incorporated into the Judaic Codex. Otherwise, why should they include the northern texts? And there are many of them. The early Jacob cycle, for instance, uh, which uh, is uh, typically geographically played on in, in, in the northern territory, or the heroic stories in the book of uh, uh, Judges and some of the royal traditions. And some of the royal traditions are even hostile to the Davidic, Davidic dynasty. So we need to ask why. Why wasn't there a censor in Judah to take all these traditions out? Why sh should uh, the biblical southern Judahite, Jerusalemite authors leave these negative traditions in the text? The answer would, should be that they did not have any other choice because the, of the composition, population composition, demographic composition in Judah uh, at that time, half of Judah perhaps, a big portion of the Judahite population was Israelite and their traditions had to be respected. Not only that, some of the traditions that these Israelites brought with them were then taken over by the Judahite, Jerusalemite authors and put into the service of the ideology and theology of Judah in, in the later century, in the seventh century, in the time of King Josiah, for instance. Let me give you one example. I think that the idea of a great united monarchy uh, started boiling, so to speak, in Judah uh, in the second half of the eighth century with this uh, very dramatic transformation of the kingdom. The kingdom now becomes, in fact, a united monarchy within of Israelites and Judahites. And also later when the Assyrians pull out and the Judahite uh, scribes uh, uh, feel safe to try promote this idea to an actual territorial expansion into the territories of, the, of ex Israel, the Northern Kingdom, this too resonates with the situation in Judah 
in the 7th century BC. When I say the situation, I mean the demographic composition. You've described the development of Jerusalem into this metropolis in the 7th century with Israelites and Judahites and, and this being uh, the key moment for one of the big steps in the production of the biblical text. Let's summarize the entire argument. So how, how do we get to late monarchic times? Indeed, Jerusalem is the hub of the uh, territorial entity of the Southern Highlands. And this uh, had been the situation in the Bronze Age, and this continued to be the situation in the Iron Age in the division between Israel and Judah. So this is the role of Jerusalem. The mound of Jerusalem was probably located on the Temple Mount. Uh, there is no way to understand the mound of Jerusalem on the city of David Ridge, so to speak, to the south of the Temple Mount. And though the mound could have been small but significant, the importance of Jerusalem is big, as we can see in the Amarna period. And this Amarna period situation of the mound on the Temple Mount continues until the 9th century BC. In fact, until the 9th century BC, we can speak in Jerusalem still about an Amarna situation, so to speak, similar to the one which is depicted in the Amarna letters. And this is the situation also, of course, for the 10th century BC, for the time of David and Solomon. The first expansion of the city, the first change, comes in the 9th century BC, perhaps in the second half of the 9th century, when the city expands to the south in the direction of the spring. And there is good reason to suggest that the mount on the Temple Mount was already fortified. Why? Because towns in the countryside of Judah are fortified at that phase, so there's no logic to suggest that the capital was not. So Jerusalem grows from five hectares to something like nine hectares, becomes quite significant, but not yet the big city that we know at late monarchic times. The last phase, the big leap forward, comes in the second half of the eighth century, when Jerusalem all of a sudden, in a relatively short period of time, expands, booms, uh, to become a very big city, the biggest in the country, stretching over an area of about 60 hectares, which means growing six times bigger than the phase before, in, as I mentioned, in a short period of time. And in my opinion, this is the result of migration of, uh, or coming of refugees from the Northern Kingdom, from Israel, after the takeover of Israel by Assyria, and also the result of Judah uh, having been incorporated into the Assyrian uh, global economy. And this situation of big Jerusalem continues until the Babylonian destruction in the beginning of the 6th century, 586 BC. And this situation of big Jerusalem with a demographic composition of Israelites and Judahites is the background for understanding the development of composition of historical biblical texts uh, starting in Jerusalem in the late 8th century and continuing even stronger and more so in the 7th century BC until the time of Josiah and later. Uh, this of course isn't the end of the story of Jerusalem. We have several other topics to cover in upcoming conversations and we will of course circle back to Jerusalem in the Persian and Hellenistic periods. Absolutely. All right. Thanks. See you next time.